EV 2.0 is here, and is it replacing cycles? No, it's not. But it is closing the gap by a large margin. What that means is that if cycles is too slow to render on your computer, that now you can get much closer results with EV 2.0. They've added a lot of features like ray tracing, displacement maps, and emission lighting, and we're gonna go through all of that. But in this video, we're also going to go through every setting in the render EV engine. That way, if you're a beginner, you should feel pretty confident working in EV by the end of this video. So with that being said, let's dive in and start learning. So diving into the biggest new feature, of course, which is ray tracing. Check this out. If I turn this off, look at that. Look how flat that is. And I turn it on and look how nice that looks. Now here it is compared to the original Cycles version. And I'm going to be using this scene from my short film to show off how to use these ray tracing effects because I have a lot of normal maps. I have world lighting, I have regular lighting. And if I zoom in here, I have this see-through glass reflective bottle up front and a high depth of field. So this is just kind of a great scene to show off the power of EV's new ray tracing. So let's dive in and look at all these settings that we have here. So first, just clicking on ray tracing is gonna make everything look better. If you're not familiar with what ray tracing is, it means that it's tracing light rays as they bounce around the scene. This is what Cycles does and why it looks so realistic. Now, if I go ahead and dive into the method here, our first option, it's by default set to screen trace. What this is going to do is trace all those light rays and get them within the screen space. It will only use light probes if the ray exits that screen space. The other method you have is light probe here. And if you've used EV2 prior versions, you know that you have these light probe objects where you can bake in lighting data. So by using light probe, you can kind of return to that old method. However, I recommend staying on screen trace and just using light probes, which will help inform kind of outside the screen space. Now, next up, you have the resolution. This is a bit misleading. The lower the number is actually the higher the resolution. This is a one-to-one -one resolution. You just wanna set this as low as you can without your scene lagging too much. Next up, we have the max roughness, which will set the max roughness for kind of these screen space bouncing around. If I go ahead and turn this up, you can see here in the back, how my rocks are becoming much more diffuse. And if I set this back down to 0.5, you can see how that's kind of altering that back there. So you can set that to whatever you want. Next up is screen tracing. Now precision by default is set to 0.25. The higher you can get this, the more precise it will be and the better it will be. However, the slower it will be. I recommend bumping this one in particular as high as you can. Next up, we have thickness, and this is going to determine how thick to consider pixels are for depth buffers. It gets pretty complicated, Let's just show what it does in a practicality example here. If I zoom in here on this bottle and I turn this thickness up, you can see that I'm getting more like visible reflections through here, but it's also starting to stretch those reflections. So what I'd recommend for thickness is setting this as kind of low as you can without losing that reflective ability. So by setting mine to like 0.15, you can see that it can still see through my glass here, but I'm losing those stretched pixels. Next up, we have denoising. Now, of course, this will remove noise at your image, but at the expense of a bit of sharpness. Now, you see that you have various options here. You can play with these options if you like, but honestly, I think you just need to decide whether you're gonna use denoising or not. You don't need to worry about these individual controls here. If you're enjoying this video, please maybe stop and check out my Patreon. I put up a lot of projects on there that you can download and use. I put up shaders and I also put scene breakdowns and kind of casual tutorials as well. But let's get back to the main video. Now the global illumination here is a massive setting to consider because with global illumination here, we can get light bouncing. So, you know, this red can bounce red onto her body, something that previously wasn't possible in Eevee. Now there's two methods here. There's global illumination, which is going to give you more realistic colored bounces in between light rays, or you can turn on ambient inclusion here, which will render a bit faster at the expense of a little bit of realism. And then if we come down here, we again have a resolution option. Again, you wanna get this as close to one-to-one -one as you can that your computer can handle. But now we have rays and steps. So we can actually turn up the amount of rays that global illumination is using to calculate those light bounces. Now by default, it's set pretty low to something like two, but the higher you can get this, the better it is, but you really don't need to go above 12 in my opinion. And then below that, we have these steps, which is the amount to kind of sample those per GI. And I think that by default, that's set to eight. Again, you wanna bounce this as high as you can. If you go up to something like 64, you're gonna be in a really good spot. And then here we have precision. Again, by default, this will be set to something like 0.25, but getting that as high as you can to one to create a more precise 
global illumination calculation. Lastly, we have some real in-depth control here about the distance. So global illumination, as I said, is lights bouncing off objects near each other. So if you wanted, you could limit that distance and say that objects could only bounce off each other from one meter away. And then you can control the thickness, how far, and the bias of all of that. However, I recommend just leaving these at default settings and they look pretty good as is. So that covers all the settings in the ray tracing menu, but the thing is that ray tracing affects the overall render engine. So our light probes, our light objects, and some of these other menus also have settings that pertain to ray tracing as well. So let's look at those next. So up here we have clamping now. If you're not familiar with clamping, what this does is reduce the amount of light that can bounce around a scene and limit it because when you put something like a really bright light source in a dark room, it can create firefly pixels, which are bright, noisy pixels. Now, by default, they've set it to 10. This should remove most things. However, if you add a volumetric fog to your scene, that can introduce fireflies, and you could go ahead and set this to 10 here too. Now, you can bump up this direct light, but that's gonna go ahead and start removing light rays from your scene and really darken the overall scene, so I don't recommend putting anything in here, but if you really can't get rid of them, you can set something really small, like 0.1 or just one. Let's take a look at this sampling menu next. Now that we're using light rays and ray tracing, we're gonna need more samples. Here in our viewport, you'll see that we have temporal reprojection and jitter shadows. This is just to help in the viewport, just to create a little bit more of a stable look while you're looking at it in real time. Here, of course, in the render, you can set your samples. The higher, the better, but you don't need to go super high in EV. I wouldn't really go past 512. And then here we have our shadows. And here in the shadows, we can contribute how much light rays are bouncing around. So here, if I come to the rays, I can bump this up. And I believe four is the highest you can set it to. By default, it's one or two. And then you can also bump up the steps on how it processes those. And then you can also turn up your shadow resolution here. Now, if you have a volumetric fog on the scene, I would click this on and set your steps around something like between 16 and 64. Now, under advanced here, you can also change your light threshold, though you shouldn't really need to ever adjust that setting. Now, the depth of field's actually just kind of been improved by default, so you shouldn't have to change much for it to look this good. However, there are settings here you can control, and there's a lot to do here, but you really rarely need to adjust these settings. What you really need to pay attention to is jitter camera. You can turn this on, and this can sometimes kind of help over blur the pixels and provide a somewhat more stable looking depth of field. <laughs> Now with ray tracing, it's also changing how our lights work too. So if we grab one of these lights, you'll notice that we have a lot of different options over here that we didn't before. So let's go ahead and take a look at these. So one thing we can do to improve the lighting quality here is we can turn on this jitter option here. And what this is going to do is jitter the soft shadows to increase the shadow precision. The problem being that it's going to have a high performance impact. So the more of these you turn on, the slower your scene's going to get but the more realistic it's going to get. And you'll notice under jitter, we have this overblur option. What this is going to do is kind of reduce under sampling artifacts. So you can turn this up and get less sampling issues. And then below that, we have the filter, which will blur the shadow aliasing. This can kind of help depend with the map resolution. And then below that, we have the resolution limit. Now, the lower you set this, the better it's going to look. So if I set mine down to something like 0.001, it's going to give me a bit more realistic shadow resolution. And then down here, we can control the influence over every ray. Diffuse, glossy, transmission, volume scatter. But the thing is, if you change any of these to any value besides one, it will be inaccurate. However, these are here for artistic control. Now lastly, I wanna dive into the light probes. So the light probes are just like they were before. We have spheres, planes, and volumes that we can add into our scene. However, before everything was baked under this menu here, and you may notice that that is no longer here. Well, now it is on the light probes themselves. So go to the light probe, come down to the data tab here, and then under bake, you can set the bake. And just like before, we can increase our resolution, the amount of samples and everything. Now, as I mentioned before, if you're using screen trace, it's only gonna rely on these light bakes for things that fall outside of the screen space. So they can still help enhance your scene with lighting, but they're not nearly as necessary as they were before to get realistic renders. So you may also notice here that if we come into our materials and we come down to the settings, we have a lot more options here in terms of how they work with ray tracing. So whenever you're doing things like refractive objects, these settings are gonna become very important as are when you're trying to displace materials as well. So diving into these settings individually, backface culling refers to the back faces of your object 
according to the camera's position. So by turning this on for the camera, you can see that what I'm doing is reducing the transparent effect back there and effectively making this glass slightly more see-through. This is a creative decision, not necessarily a realistic decision. You can do the same thing and calculate it for shadows if you like. And if you're using light probes with the volumes here baked, you can use that as well. Now for the displacement here, you can set this to bump, displacement, or displacement and bump, just like you can in cycles. And then you can also set the maximum distance here for how much you're allowed to displace this material. This is awesome because displacement takes forever to render in cycle. So being able to do this so quickly in a software like Eevee is really exciting. Below that, we have transparent shadows where we can turn on transparent shadows. As you can see here, that is helping greatly with the glass. And then down here, we have rendered methods called dithered and blended. This is going to be how it's kind of handling those see-through parts. Dithered will make it so that it allows for a grayscale transparency and it will render it in layers. This will actually work with render layers and other things, whereas blended won't. So I recommend leaving it on dithered. Then you can also ray trace the transmissions. And if I turn that on, you can see that we're getting slightly more realistic transmission rays there. Now down here on the thickness, you can set this to slab or sphere. So sphere is going to be more spherical objects and slab is going to be more like flat surfaces like glass panes. So since I have a bottle here, I'm going to go ahead and choose sphere and you can see how that immediately changes how the reflections work. And then down here, you can tick on from shadow. And what this will do is use shadow maps and casting lights to kind of help refine the thickness. So I'm going to go ahead and click that on and hope that it helps get me a little bit more of a realistic result. Lastly, down here, if you have volumes, in your scenes or in materials, you can change between fast and accurate. So that's like a deep dive into how ray tracing works in the new version of Eevee. I hope you found this useful. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Are there other things you'd like me to cover in Eevee? If so, let me know.